Hi everyone, this is Neil Reiter here, also known as the Wax Whisperer. Thank you for joining me in my latest video. This is of a patient who attended with a condition called eczematous otitis externa, and I'll describe that in more detail during the course of the video, uh, which has meant that this patient needs their ears cleaning at least twice a year. And it's a very difficult case because of the consistency of this dead skin and earwax. Um, so they first attended to see me back in January of this year. And prior to that, they've seen many specialists, um, been to the hospital as well. And understandably, it's been very difficult for the specialist who have treated this patient to remove this blockage. And the patient ha can find it very painful and uncomfortable during the procedure. And uh, when they visited last time, they're very pleased and um, they, they decided to come back to have it performed again. And you can see this occlusion, this dead skin and wax. It's very glutinous, very mushy. It's the most difficult type of occlusion to remove because ideally when you're performing microsuction or removing wax, when you make contact with the wax, either with the, the suction probe or with an ENT micro instrument, you're hoping to retrieve it and extract it in big lumps and pieces. But here it's all smothered. It's like soft butter. That's the best analogy I can give, actually. In the past, I've used, um, uh, I've compared it to mashed potatoes, as you can probably see and enjoy my food analogies. However, I think this is a better description of this is um, lard or soft butter, and it's, it's just compacted in the ear. So we're trying to remove this without making contact with the patient's ear canal. Because of their condition, eczematous or otitis externa, they, they do have a bit of tenderness, underlying pain uh, of the ear canal, which makes it just more difficult to remove. Their entrance of the ear canal is quite narrow as well. And what I'm trying to do here, the first part of the procedure, I just want to reveal their eardrum. That's why they've come. They want to, they want to hear. Everything around the edge is secondary. That's all a bonus. I just want to visualise their eardrum and I want this patient to hear. So I'm just going straight down the middle. Um, with this, you can't peel it off the canal wall because of the consistency. So sometimes when you've got, for example, more crusted or dried um, dead skin or wax that's lying in the ear canal, you can actually peel it off the ear canal and it will go towards the eardrum. So it helps you remove the the blockage off the eardrum. But here, it's it's um, independent. Um, the blockage on the ear, ear canal is independent of the blockage uh, coat in the ear canal. So the challenge a bit here is to, to decipher how thick this layer of dead keratin and wax is on the eardrum. If I uh, submerge and poke in too far with the suction probe, thinking it's a thick layer, I can quite easily make contact with the patient's eardrum and potentially even perforate it. So I'm almost sparring with it. Um, now, uh, What's um, eczematous otitis externa? So otitis externa is an umbrella term uh, given to an infection or inflammation of the outer ear. What's the outer ear? The outer ear uh, consists of three main parts. It's the pinna, which is the satellite dish we have either side of our, our heads. It's the ear canal and it's the outermost membrane of the eardrum. So that's the outer ear. So any infection, inflammation, that affects those three parts of the ear, it's known as otitis externa. And eczematous otitis externa is a bit more of a uh, specific diagnosis. So eczema, so um, this patient suffers from eczema of the parts of the body, but also in the ears. And it leads to, it's a chronic condition, and it just leads to a high rate of skin turnover in the ear. So this skin, um, as it is, the, the ears producing a lot more de uh, skin, which then that skin then dies and sheds, and it can't naturally come out of the ear. It, it, it may come out of the ear, but because it's producing so much as a natural buildup, the ear can't keep up with the rate of the skin that the ear is producing itself and dying. Um, so it's just not migrating the dead skin quick enough as a result. And when, the, when you've got a collection of dead skin in the ear, it, it can become macerated, it can become uh, moist and, and damp. And that can then lead to an infection because bacteria, fungi can feed off this, the skin. Uh, the skin also 
uh, releases proteolactic enzymes, which can potentially start to ulcerate the skin and start decaying the underlying structures of the ear, so the bony part, the temporal bone, the cartilage on the outer third of the ear canal. And there's no real treatment for this patient. There's more don'ts than do. So um, they've seen the NT in the past. Uh, strict water precautions. That's the most important thing when you've got otitis externa. You just want to avoid water like the plague. Um, water will just exacerbate this. It will macerate the dead skin. It will lead to more infection. It can get waterlogged in the ear because there is a bit uh, of a narrowing in the ear canal already. So you just want to stay away from water. Avoid um, wearing ear pods and headphones because these can increase humidity and sweat in the ear. And apparently I read somewhere wearing ear pods can um, increase the number of bacteria in your ear by 700 uh, times. So that's quite a huge amount. So we're, we're just working on the eardrum, I'm just using a lot of um, olive oil drops here just to change the consistency because it's mushy, I want to bind it together. And I'm using the fine end and I can see a hint of the eardrum around two o'clock. I can see a bit of a, a blue pearly uh, appearance coming through this debris and I'm just kissing the surface. I'm, I'm, I'm half ready to come away if it becomes uncomfortable for the patient. So just don't want to make it an uncomfortable experience. If this patient's asleep uh, and or they've got some uh, anesthesia, then we could probably be a bit more, um, not invasive, but we can, be, we can, don't have to be as conservative, but um, the patient's awake. As an audiologist in the UK, we can't prescribe uh, any, or administer any local anesthetic. Now, there is a drops that we actually sell called Clear Relief Drops, which contains topical lidocaine, but that's not going to be enough uh, in this instance. It's not really going to have a massive effect. Um, if you've got a bit of discomfort, a bit of pain, you've got a bit of water in your ear and you can feel that, lidocaine will help numb it slightly, but uh, because it's over the counter, it's a very low dose. But in this case, it's just not going to have much of, of an impact. So... Um, Slowly but surely, just try to clear as much debris um, as possible. And again, I don't want to poke too hard with the suction probe because I just don't know where the eardrum is in relation to this thick um, consistency of dead skin that's lining the eardrum. See, the posterior part of the ear can have slightly swollen, there's a bit of swelling there. So I've just put a bit more drops in. And the olive oil is going to help because it will help moisturize the skin. So this is something else that they've been advised by ENT. They've been advised to use acetic acid on a regular basis. Acetic acid will help. When you you can imagine if you've got a condition like this, your ear is going to be very, very itchy. So uh, you, have, you have the uh, urge of poking and scratching inside your ear. So acetic acid spray can obviate the need for someone to poke in the ear because it just calms the ear. So if you have got an itch, it's a very good thing to use. Um, and also to moisturize this, the ear canal on a regular basis, the uh, ears may also not be producing enough natural oils and sweats, hence why there's a lot of dead skin uh, uh, formulating and developing in the ear. So olive oil spray can help moisturize the skin. It'll also help the underlying skin that's lining the ear canal to retain its natural moisture and prevent it from drying and flaking and cracking. So now we can see the majority of the eardrum. And at this stage, this patient could hear significantly better. Everything else now from here is a bonus. Now, um, I know some people are not going to be happy at the end of the video because there's a bit left here and there, but um, my main objective is to get this patient hearing and uh, not to cause any discomfort in that process which thankfully we see uh, we managed to achieve and the patient is very very grateful again and i'm now just going to spend as much time as possible to remove this as, to, uh, as much as i can and again i'm trying to do this without touching the canal wall uh, using a jobs and horn here to s kind of scrape off this it's not going to help because first of all we're going to make contact with the canal wall and remember this patient's got some uh, discomfort tenderness already um, some of it's on the bony part of the ear canal as well, which is very sensitive. Also, a Jobson horn's just going to spread this light. 
I mentioned um, the consistency reminded me of soft butter. So using a Jobson horn is just going to spread this soft butter against the ear canal as opposed to really removing it. So I'm just going to hover over it. Um, the patient is already aware that we're not going to remove all of it. And truth be told, it's not really going to make much difference. This patient's going to have to return. It's a chronic condition, fortunately, for them. So even if we left it at this, this patient is just going to, the skin's going to develop again. Of course, it would mean that they would need to come more regularly. So the idea is now just to get as much as I can. So it just prolongs the next appointment, even if it's by a few weeks. Uh, by the looks of it, it's going to be every six months, so biannually. And I've just bent the fine end suction probe in such a way where I'm almost gliding across the canal wall without the tip penetrating or protruding towards the, the surface of the canal wall. So um, it's very important that this patient avoids water. So water, as I discussed earlier, it'll wash away the natural acidity that we have in our ears. Um, and it will also wash away any natural oils this patient has that's lining the ear canal wall. And we want to retain those natural oils because they will help the underlying skin, as I discussed earlier, from retaining its internal moisture and preventing it from drying and cracking, which will then only exacerbate this condition. So water is a big no-no. Um, they had had their ears irrigated in the past, which really set, uh, uh, led on to an acute ear infection, so swimmer's ear. I'm just slowly working on the back part of the ear canal here. See, there's a few hairs. Now, these hairs, um, they should only be located on the outer third, the cartilage portion, which the majority are, as you can see. And that's because the cartilage portion of the ear canal contains the dermis layer of skin. So the skin that lines the ear canal, it varies depending upon its location. The outer third, the skin is quite thick. It's one millimetre in thickness. And it has three layers. You've got the epidermis, which is the outer barrier of the skin. And the epidermis constantly... Um, replaces itself and sheds itself. The dermis is the uh, so the the uh, the middle layer, if you like, and that contains collagen, elastin, and also the hair follicles and little muscles called erector muscles to help these hair strands that protrude from the follicles to um, enter uh, the ear canal itself. So it holds them upright. And then you've got a subcutaneous layer, which is made up of insulating fat and connective tissue. Uh, there is a few hairs here. Um, you can see, so the patient did say that they're not poking the ears, and I've got no reason to doubt them, but there is a few hairs. And that could have been from a historic um, ear syringing, possibly. That's just flushed this further down to the ear. But... Um, Hopefully they're not poking in the ear because we have to ask ourselves why these hairs up here, up and right against the eardrum. That would be great if the whole ear canal was made up of cartilage because if it was the case, then um, we could actually apply a lot more pressure deep in the ear, like I sometimes do on the outer third of the ear canal, without causing any pain or discomfort for the patient, but. The ear anatomy is such that the inner two thirds is made of bone. So the bony part of the ear canal has got a very thin layer of skin. It's just the epidermis, it's the outermost layer. It doesn't have the dermis, it doesn't have the subcutaneous layer of fat. And that makes the, the bony part of the ear canal extremely sensitive. It's almost um, like your shin region um, or your elbow, that they are very, very sensitive because the bone is really exposed and so this patient's ear canal, the diameter is approximately, I would say, 0 0.5, 0 0.6 in, in terms of width. The height is probably 0 0.7. So it's a really, really small cavity. Um, and there's bends and twists in there. The ear, average ear canal length for uh, an adult human is around 26 millimetres. Um, typically, the ear canal is a bit longer uh, and the diameter is greater for men in comparison to women. And of course, um, adults have longer and larger ear canals 
in comparison to children. So it's a small area that we're working in, uh, which makes it a bit more tricky. So you can see we've got some soft debris at the top and throughout the procedure of just ensuring the patient's okay. So I'm just gliding, hovering over and any other consistency of wax or dead skin, this is coming away. So it's going to get attracted by the suction and peel away and come out in larger pieces. But here it's not, it's almost inadvertently spreading some of this as well. So all that I'm vacuuming, so I am getting some of it out, but other parts, I suspect I'm also just pushing and compressing against the canal wall and spreading it, which is counterintuitive really. So it's that fine line of when to, when no to stop. So we're just entering the ear and this is where, this is the second bend of the ear canal. This is where the ear canal straightens. So the second bend is about a half a centimeter into the ear canal, it's about one third in. It's where the cartilage part of the ear canal and the bone meet, so the osseo, uh, osseous, uh, osseocartilineous portion. So whenever we're training our clear wax delegates, I always describe the outer third of the ear canal as being the, the safe zone, inverted commas, and the inner two thirds as being the danger zone. Um, just to give you guys some updates on other things that's going on. So the wax scope, uh, we're almost ready to launch. Uh, in fact, the wax scope is ready to be launched, but I'm just waiting now for the launch uh, of the instruments I'm also uh, bringing to market. So we've got four instruments. We've got a double-ended ear, uh, ear hook. And I'm, I'm naming so it as a uh, within or most uh, healthcare sectors, um, the... Uh, the developer introduces the name into the instrument. So uh, I'm going to name the instruments um, uh, the Rye Ear Hook, uh, which is the one of the uh, was one of the uh, instruments. So it's a double ended ear hook with a twist. So uh, I'll I'll leave that until it's launched. So the Rye double double ended ear hook. Uh, also uh, the Rye double ended ear correct. So uh, similar to Jobs and Horn, but I've modified. The, the shape and the architecture of the the spoon at the end. Even the ear hook's different to the normal ear hook that you see me using. I've, I've just uh, modified that to make it more effective. I've also introduced a new product. Um, it's called the Rye Ear Pick. And again, that's double-ended. Um, that uh, probably I'm going to be using quite a lot. I'm really excited by that one. And then I've got another instrument, which which I'll again uh, I'll reveal uh, later to the time. And also, we have just today. Uh, I've just filed a patent for a very unique suction probe. Um, again, I'm not. I'm gonna speak about that probably a bit later, but I'm really really excited by that. It's hopefully gonna resolve one of the major issues or concerns that both specialists and uh, patients may have about performing microsuction, um, which currently there's, there are alternative remedies for this particular concern, but they're not very practical. Um, so yeah, I'm really, really looking forward to that. And I will discuss that in more depth, but yeah, we've just submitted the patent for that. So um, just today actually, so it's great news. Um, so in terms of the wax scope, I don't want to give any dates because um, last time we got let down and um, I don't want to give any dates until it's well, till I'm ready to launch. But as I said, it is actually, the wax scope is ready. That's not, not what we're waiting for now, waiting for the instruments. Um, I'm also developing a new app. Oops, I used the app the other day uh, where you saw I could zoom in, which is very useful. So we're trying to launch everything in one go. I think that just makes sense. We've come so far. So yeah, uh, exciting times ahead. It's going to be a very busy next few months. And um, once all that's launched, I've got a couple of other new, uh, new developments in the pipeline, which I'm excited by. Uh, I, um, again, I can't really disclose much at the moment, unfortunately, but yeah, it's very exciting. Uh, and I'm working with a colleague on one of them. So that's the patient's eardrum. It's fully revealed now. I can see the hammer bone as well. There is a bit of debris around the edge, but that's all fine. Well, I hope you enjoyed that video, guys. Take care. Keep well and speak soon. Bye.